Hi, this is Oliver Robbins of Poltergeist fame and upcoming Celebrity Crush. You're watching CF3. <laughs> Hello and welcome to CF3 TV, brought to you by Project Nerd. I'm Dane Michael. I'm Jeff Johnson. And our co-host is wearing a Star Trek shirt to a poltergeist show. Um, where are you broadcasting from, <laughs> James Marves? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm in my bedroom in front of my mother $180 green screen setup that doesn't work with the program we're using. Thank you for asking. Oh, I thought you were in your pajamas. I mean. <laughs> yeah, you are in a onesie, so. <laughs> it's just a, a onesie. On, Scotty. This is a onesie. We are doing a, a new thing here. So last year, we actually, during the pandemic beginning of it, we interviewed actor Oliver Robbins star of Poltergeist, Airplane 2, and some other great things, television. And we thought, you know what? This is really good video footage, and we were a podcast at the time. So we're bringing you, for the first time, this interview with Oliver as a video. And it was the first time that he was ever using Zoom, which I'm sure he would go on to use quite a bit in the rest of 2020. Um, it was a great interview, and that's why we feel like it, it's necessary to bring it to our YouTube show. And we are going to record a brand new movie segment and review for you guys to air after that. But for now, let's start off with the interview with Oliver. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Oliver Robbins. <laughs> Oh, yeah. here with you guys and my very first zoom uh conference call interview meeting whatever you want to call it wave of the future everybody's this, doing it this Your is zoom so cherry awesome. has now been popped <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here I'm, I'm, no, I'm no longer a newbie so what kinds of movies and tv shows did you like to watch prior to getting into the business yourself I loved all, pretty much all genres too. I loved romantic comedies. I loved horror. I loved comedy in general. I loved, as a little boy growing up, I loved the movie Airplane. And when Airplane, they announced Airplane 2, I told my agent at the time, I was a little boy and I was really precocious. I said, I want to be in Airplane 2. And lo and behold, there was a part that I could audition for. I told all my friends about it. And I'm like, you have to get that part. You have to get that role. And uh, I went out for the audition and um, I, I got the role and you know, the producer was fantastic. It was Howard Koch and it's an old time producer. And uh, he gave me the part like within just like two auditions. And, you know, it was, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever done at that point. And other than Poltergeist, of course. Um, and the cast and crew were incredibly nice to me. And yeah. So anyways, that's, that was the kind of movie I really liked growing up though too. But I was really into like, I was really into like esoteric kind of films too. Like I'd watch like the exorcist, you know, and there was a show called Z channel um, that basically had all these bizarre movies. And it was, it was an early cable station. It was only like, I guess in Los Angeles, they actually made a documentary about it called the Z channel. And I was had my parents just left me alone and I was able to watch anything I wanted, which was good and bad. So I saw movies that I, I probably should not have seen until I was like much older, like The Exorcist, too. That literally gave me nightmares. But, you know, I was exposed to a lot of great cinema. Wow. Uh, I wanted to ask you, since you brought up Airplane 2, uh, there were so many memorable, like, actors, character actors, stars in that film. Who do you remember specifically working with on set? Like, did you get to, like, meet Sonny Bono and William yeah, Shatner people. or... I became I became really friendly with Sonny Bono. He was a great guy too, and he invited me back to his house, and I played with his cousins, and he told me all about his background and everything he had done, and he was just super sweet. 
We play tennis. Um, and, you know, it's funny because everyone said, you know, Sonny Bono's, you know, really famous. And I didn't know who he was at all. He was just a nice guy on the set, too. Um, and Robert Hayes was fantastic. And Julie Haggerty was so sweet. And, you know, everyone was just so kind to me on that on that show, too. And even the director, Ken Finkelman, um, he had a tough go on that movie because the studio at the time wanted to do a version exactly like Airplane One. And no doubt, that was fantastic. But right. he was trying to do some original things. And they really kind of fought him with that. And I used to see him, you know, and not in the happiest mood a lot of times. But, you know, for me, at least it taught me when you're making a movie, if you believe in something, you have to defend yourself and fight for what you believe in. Because if you don't believe in it, really, no one else will. Um, but overall, everyone was just really great on that set. You kind of grew up in the film and TV industry. What was that like growing up while you were working? Well, you know, it's funny. I had no intent to become a professional actor. It was just kind of a hobby that grew into something bigger. Um, my parents, you know, I told them, I said, you know, I'd like to become an actor. And like weeks before that, I wanted to be a police officer. And before that, I wanted to be a fireman. And they're like, okay, we'll get them off our back and we'll put them in a commercial <laughs> workshop class. And at the end of the class, my parents thought, thought it'll be over. He'll just move on with his life. And instead, the, the, the teacher said, you know, he, you know, Oliver's pretty good. We should we should have him in other like we should have him act possibly professionally. My parents were like, "What? What is? What does that really mean?" <laughs> I thought you know child acting was one step above child pornography too. And okay. my parents were you know pretty conservative, and they're like, "No, this is how it works." And it was a whole new world. And fortunately, I was introduced to some really great people. This agency called Herb Tannen at the time too, and they handled all the major child actors. And they just started sending me on auditions. And my very first commercial was a uh, was a fertilizer commercial. Believe it or not, that was my that was my big premiere acting in a fertilizer ad. And my co-star in that was the guy who wrote the movie Starman and Stand by Me. Because a lot of writers, when they're struggling, you know, do acting on the side or commercials just to pay the bills. And he played my father in it. So after I did that, then we got to Poltergeist, and there was an there was an open call. Literally, what an open call is where anyone can audition for it. And they were, I think at this point, like desperate because they were going into production within like, I guess around 90 days. They already looked in New York, they looked in LA, they looked in Florida and they didn't have the kid yet. So um, I said to my mom, I said, yeah, let's go on this open call. And she said, do you really want to wait for hours outside the studio? I'm like, what else are we going to do on a Saturday? So <laughs> we went outside MGM and I met with uh, the casting person, Mike Fenton and Jane Feinberg. And they were just, they asked me these questions. They were like, you know, Oliver, what are you afraid of? And I said, well, I'm afraid of this tree outside. I'm afraid of this clown doll. Basically, I was afraid of everything my character was afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know I was just basically describing Robbie Freeling at the time, too. Um, so, and so they had me come back. And then I, and I read for Mr. Spielberg and Mr. Hooper. And they, they really liked me because I was really natural. But the one problem they really had was that I couldn't scream. And I was talking to Toby Hooper, the director, and he said to me, Oliver, you know, the secret to great horror is to scream. You have to be able to scream. And I was like, I would scream and like nothing would come out. And I was, and I was going to get the part. So believe it or not, in Los Angeles at that time, they had people who specialized in teaching you how to scream. That's all like their, that was like their spe like scream specialist. <laughs> scream artists. So, yeah. There's, there's Mr. Like, Wilhelm. <laughs> scream experts. So they had me go in and meet with the scream gut person and they said, you want to take it from your chest? You want to scream like, it's like singing almost. So I, I learned to scream. I went back in, I showed them my amazing scream I had now and uh, I was given the part. You had a great scream. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was seasoned. And uh, how old were you when you started going out on um, audition? Or, yeah, audition. I was, a, I was around nine years old when I started doing commercials and um, the business was actually pretty small, believe it or not, at that time. I knew all of the people that we see in movies of the 80s at that time. And, you know, and I loved it because there were, I was really, you know, honestly, an introverted kid, uh, believe it or not. And you don't think that because you think, you know, he's an actor. He, he emotes. But I was actually, that allowed me to really come out of myself, you know, and really become a different person. Um, I was a little guy and I was, I was beat up all the time. I was always bullied. So, and acting kind of allowed me to really escape the bullies and, and become a bigger and, you know, different person on screen. And I kind of used that, you know, as my pre-acting before I became a professional actor. Were you uh, intimidated by 
anything about Hollywood? Like, was it intimidating meeting Spielberg, for example? Well, you know, it's funny because I think ignorance is really bliss. I didn't know who any of these people were. They were just very friendly and nice. And I was just, and they made it feel like summer camp. They made it feel like a game. Like, you we're going to go out. I remember Frank Marshall was telling me on set. He said, you know, Oliver, you know, we have this great set set up here and all the toys you're going to get to play with. And I just looked at it as a new challenge every day. And you never, you don't have any fear as a kid, though, too. At least I didn't. You know, I was a tough and bumble, tumble kind of kid. I dropped ball out of trees and, you know, no pun intended there. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, they, they, you know, they say, and they always told me, like, we're going to do this new thing today you're going to be attacked by a tree. I'm like, okay, let's go with that. And then they, you know, talked about this clown doll and how we're going to do the scene and all the special effects with that. You know, you really, you know, as a kid, you're really open to everything. And I just saw it as fun and a challenge. And I had no idea that we were really creating a true, you know, horror movie that was indeed very scary. In my top 10. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, it's thank you. in the top 10 for a lot of people. Now, you worked, you just brought up Toby Hooper. What was that like working with him? I loved working with Toby. He was very calm and, um, and very, you know, he was kind of introverted too. He didn't really say a lot, but everything he did say was of value and importance. And it really made you listen too. Um, I, I worked with a lot of directors after that who weren't as, you know, you know, giving and loving and caring to children on a set. Um, you know, they would tell you what to do. And when you didn't do it, you get yelled at. And I wasn't really used to that at all, too, because I really, as a kid, especially I, when I get yelled at, I really shut down and I really can't give you what you're what the director wants. Um, but he just let me just be a kid. And, you know, and I remember I remember I was reading in film school, I was reading the you know this great book about Truffaut and he talked about working with kids. And he said, you know, working with kids, you have to have a lot of patience. But, you, you know, he compared it to working on a helicopter shot. And at the time, they didn't have drones. And if you wanted to get a shot like that, you had to mount the camera and do all these things and get it set up. And it took all day to get that shot. But he said, you know, you get something so beautiful and so natural and gorgeous that it's worth taking that, that kind of time to do it. And that's what it's like working with children. We're not trained actors. We have no, you know, official training in that respect. So you just have to toy with them and, and, and make them feel natural and get that emotion and get that performance too. And that's what Toby really did for me too. I mean, everyone on that set was like that. It allowed me to feel free and natural. And a lot of those lines I had lived and it was really a team effort. Like if I had an idea for a shot, I, I would, I would say, Hey, could we shoot this? And they didn't say, no, you're the child actor. You're not supposed to do it to talk about that. They were very much open to everything that I had, I had in mind too. Um, and that's what that entire set was. It was truly, it was really a collaborative effort. That sounds very much like Toby Hooper. Now, was Steven Spielberg on the set at all? Did he get involved with any sort of shots or anything like Steven, that? Steven was there every day because he was the writer and he was also the producer too. So it was really, you know, and having become a writer myself, you really want to, you know, help the director, you know, get your vision. And that's what, and that's what Steven did. He worked very closely with Toby. And I think that was critical because, you know, it was very much a Spielberg movie. And, you know, I think, and I know my understanding is Steven chose Toby to direct it and he really infused his amazing horror capability into that movie. So it was, in, it was, that's what makes Poltergeist so great because it has this, this amazing blend of horror, which in the horror is really indeed really scary, but it also has the heart that every Spielberg movie really has. And, you know, um, so it's, I, I think it's a really, a, a really special kind of film for that, in that respect. Yeah, I was confused at times. It felt like a Spielberg movie at times, and it felt like a Toby Hooper, Toby Hooper movie at times too. So I watching this again, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an, it's an interesting blend, and it, it really does work. And you know, it's funny in horror movies today, you really don't see that very much. Especially the family element too in these movies. You know, it's all about you know the jump scares and the special yeah. effects and getting into it in ten minutes. In Poltergeist, really, you know, the first thirty minutes, a lot really doesn't happen but you really get to know and love the family. And it's really, you know, that's, that's really the driving force, which makes all the horror all the more powerful. You're, dude, you're absolutely right. Because I was thinking as I was watching, I was like, Man, I haven't watched this really since I was a kid, mm -hmm. but the buildup, like just even like the small things that happen, <clears> it's just like, oh man, I know where this is going. Cause I kind of, I remember certain scenes from when I was a kid, like the clown and, the pool and um, it's I mean as it builds it's just 
It is. It, that's what makes it. It's the and slow it's, burn. And it changes tone a little bit too, because initially, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very playful and fun. Most horror movies today, you know, you watch The Conjuring. The Conjuring is awesome, but it never has that playful, fun kind of tone for the first thirty minutes. And I think, you know, when you're dealing with the tropes of horror, that was very daring. And only master filmmakers like Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg would be capable of, you know, quote unquote, breaking those rules of the genre. That's a great point, because I, I really enjoyed the scenes like when they were sliding Carol Ann across the floor, you yeah. know, just like having fun with it for the short amount of time they were allowed to have fun with it. But um, I was drawn in, you know, usually I watch a horror movie for like, horror right away but i was drawn in by this as like a family movie almost that gets very dark so you know it truly is too i mean like the scene when you know little caroline goes through my mother and joe beth and she says i feel her i i touch you know that is so dramatically powerful there's nothing really scary about it but you're feeling so much for the family and you and and because you set up that whole first 30 minutes and you see how much the family loves each other that moment is incredibly powerful, though, too, you know. And yet, you have all the jump scares and you have the special effects in the tree. But those scenes are only really, they're only, the way I look at only they're frosty on the cake for the entirety of the movie. And the real engine of it is that relationship between the family and the love we have for each other. Now, you mentioned that um, they kind of let you infuse Robbie's character with some of your own character. Now, Robbie was obviously a huge Star Wars fan. Was that true of young Oliver as well? I think every kid of the 1970s. <laughs> you, yeah, if you're exactly. born in the United States and you were allowed to just be in, watch any piece of popular culture, you love Star Wars. And, and now we have you know, an oversaturation. We have so many things going on. But it really, at that time, there weren't that many you know, big popular culture movies. I mean, you had Star Wars and you know, maybe Aliens and you know, maybe sports you could be into. But that was really it. And then you had the movies that were trying to become that, like Flash Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I have to, you know, the you know, only thing I've learned, I never put down movies now because it, you know, having been a filmmaker and made some not so wonderful films myself, it is so hard to make a movie. Even the worst kind of film, it takes so much work that I'm like, you know what? Flash Gordon, you know, wasn't genius, but it it, it tried. We love it. <laughs> we love it today, and we loved it as kids as well. But we, we don't love it as much as Sam Jones. <laughs> <laughs> There's an infamous story about um, strange events happening on the set of Poltergeist. Uh, you had one. What else do you remember, or did you want to talk about like that one? It's all true. The film, the set was haunted. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you know, it, dude, no, I just want to shit my pants know. when you said that. <laughs> I was like, yes! <laughs> it was all true. It was cursed, the whole movie. <laughs> I'm possessed now. It was something on the set that took me over. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, what I learned actually, you know, having gone to film school and done production, you know, crazy things happen on every set. And nothing that was really, at least when I was a kid, I didn't see anything that was that unusual that took place on the, on the movie set, you know. Um, yeah, so for me, it was just like, for me, it was camp and I had the, I had the greatest time on Poltergeist. It was like the best set. And that's what, you know, really made me want to become a filmmaker. You know, I, I had such a wonderful time on the movie. I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do for my life. And this is how I want to, I want to tell stories like this. Is there any truth to this, uh, rumor? Cause there are many rumors swirling <laughs> around all three of the Poltergeist movies. Is there any truth to the rumor that there was an incident when you were filming with the clown where it kind of went haywire technically well, and <laughs> well you know i honestly i don't remember what happens but you know my mom uh told me th that is true i guess the me mechanism of the arm um got stuck around my neck and steven like ran in there and i was like choking or something and he, and he grabbed it off my neck and he saved my he saved the day um i don't remember that happening maybe it was so traumatic that it was like i just put it out of my mind but you know the way that the way that worked is that um, the clown doll was not, and it wasn't CGI. It was electromechanical. It wasn't even electromechanical. I think it was just like a fabric arm, and the arm was extending. It was a long arm, and I guess it kind of like wrapped around my neck or something. So that's that's pretty much happened. So I guess that is true. I almost died <laughs> on that day. No, I don't think I, I don't think I went to that degree. But I, I I think I did wrap around my neck, and um, I um, Stephen got it off me. That's crazy. Now, were you intimidated by clowns then before? Like, <laughs> I was always, I, you know, I grew up in this haunted house in New York City. And I don't know if you, if you, 
even if you don't believe in this, the things that went on, I lived in this townhouse in Manhattan. I lived there till I was almost seven years old. Um, and what I hear people walking up the stairs, my mom was like, no, it's just a house settling. And I swear to this day, you can hear people creeping up the stairs. And then I had this house, I had this, my mm-hmm. room, this old Victorian room. It was this townhouse from the 1870s in Manhattan. I swore someone was inside this little playhouse I had, like someone was in there. And I'll never know if, whether it really happened or not, but I kind of tapped into all those fears. So I was, you know, when I was, I was terrified of this little room and I thought someone was inside this room, like a ghost or something. And I thought this place was haunted. And lo and behold, my parents didn't want to tell me because I was a kind of a frightful kid to begin with. They said, you know, Oliver, that house, you know, the townhouse lived in New York City. Um, it was actually a whorehouse in the Whoa. 1870s. Oh, wow. And I'm like, really? I said, yeah, and that there was a room downstairs that was red velvet, that red velvet walls. Even my dad, who didn't believe, doesn't believe in ghosts, he's this hardcore Wall Street guy, doesn't believe in anything like that. He said, he always got a chill, no matter, in the middle of the summer, in this room, like the temperature would always drop. So there was something really odd going on there, but it was good in a way, because I was able to tap into those fears um, on the set. Because Toby would say, you know, we'd be looking at some ghost coming at us. And we hadn't seen, we didn't know what it was going to look like because the special effects had not been laid in. And I asked him, I said, I said, Toby, what am I afraid of? What am I screaming at? And he says, we don't know at ILM yet, but it's the scariest thing you can possibly think of. And I always used to tap back into those fears in that New York City apartment. Um, Because I had to think of something. Um, And uh, I swear to this day that I was, I was, it was haunted. Uh, that's funny because I had a question written down that said, question for uh, Oliver and everyone else. Have you ever lived in a house that you thought might have been haunted? That's, uh, yes. that's crazy that you answered that without being asked. <laughs> it, it was. I mean, you know, maybe we don't want to, maybe it's energy or, you know, metaphysics of some kind. But and I'm sure it's explainable in a scientific approach. However, that whatever had happened, I was terrified of it as a kid. Wow. Um, Now, do you remember shooting that very intense scene with the tree bursting through the window? I've read that it was shot in reverse. That actually wasn't shot. The the clown doll scene was actually shot in reverse. Oh, okay. They actually had to act backwards. So they pulled the arm away from me. And then, you know, they had a backwards camera reverse. It was an, I'm not sure if it was an optical, it was in camera. Uh, They played it forward. So I had to start big. I started with a real big performance, like the pinnacle of my fear. And then go back to being normal. So That's like, weird. <laughs> so you play four. And they said, and they said, you know, like a kid, I was, every day was like a new challenge. And they said, so I know it's weird, but this is what you're going to do for the, this day. Because every day there was like some new interesting thing I had never done before. Um, but the tree scene, that was shot over a period of like two weeks. And you have to remember, there was no CGI. There wasn't anything like that. So everything was electromechanical or mechanical or just simply just acting, you know. So they had one tree with they had the arms that were coming in. So like you had that that was the shot where you know when the you know and then they had the POV shot of like the the tree the tree arms coming through and they shot sugar glass at me. And then you know Toby was like when the clown when the tree comes through, we want you to kind of struggle to kind of get away, but at the same time, reali- honestly, you sh- you need to get on it so it can pull you away though too. And there was a great stunt coordinator who just gotten off Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Randall. And he was like, he showed me what to do. And he said, we're going to shoot sugar glass at your face, but we want you to cover it like this because we don't want you to, we don't want you to lose an eye, you know? And I was like, and I was the kind of kid, I was like, this sounds awesome, you know? (laughs) So (laughs) every day was like an adventure like that. And then you had, you know, the tree from the far shot that was, you know, that shows how high it is, you know, that shot, you know, the tree outside for the, you know, the practical just to, you know, to establish the tree. And then when it's swallowing me, there was really, there were no special effects to that at all. I was just lowering myself down, pretending I was going to be eaten. So they said, just just look like you're struggling. Lower yourself down as you're getting to scream as you do it. And then that there's that other shot. Finally, when the, you know when the tree gets taken away, um, there was a stunt double that actually uh, doubled for me, believe it or not. And he he dropped onto the ground. Then they cut back to me, and um, it was just I was just I was basically just covering molasses in other goo for a period of like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. All right, so going back to this clown doll, I just want to know why they even had that in their house. So he could beat the crap out of it, because I got a big kick out of that. 
because you needed the jump scare in the movie. That's that's the reason. No, I don't. I don't know. I think my my character just liked those kind of things. That, that's in my mind. That's how I kind of read it. Like you know, I like Star Wars figures, and I I think every kid and his mother, you know, has a as a at least I did. I have this. I have a Charlie Chaplin doll to this day too, and you know, it just kind of sits there. And I think at that time, a lot of kids had those kind of toys. So, it you know, I think. Now it's kind of like, why would you have a clown doll like that? But in <laughs> retrospect, I think at that period in that part of the culture, um, it, it made sense. You're right, because I watched Bozo the Clown when I was a little kid. But then Poltergeist came out and I wanted nothing to do with clowns ever again. <laughs> I, I, think I, I think I traumatized an entire generation. You know, and I, I feel like I feel really good about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you jerk. Yeah. I, did, I did my part. Now, have I you... think back and I think like... Uh... Ch Chucky got a little inspiration mm -hmm. from Poltergeist a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, I think I, you know. I think every movie influences every other film yeah. too. Now, have you seen any of those dolls in recent years? Because I know of somebody who actually has one of the original clown dolls. You know, perhaps. I was in I was in England at a horror convention, and I guess someone makes them, and someone brought a couple over. And it looked pretty close to the actual one we used on set, as I remember, though, too. I personally, you know, believe it or not, I don't know if it's subconscious, but I do not have a Poltergeist clown doll at all. Oh. At all. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, how, that's how traumatic the experience was for me. <laughs> wow. Do you Funny mind if story. I ask a, a listener question? I'm ready. I just want, it's, it's a clarifying question, actually. Clarifying. The question is, do you believe, we talked a little bit about it, but do you believe in the curse. I don't believe in the curse at all, though, too. You know, I think good and bad things happen in this world, and, you know, they're unexplainable. And, you know, a movie production and people are no exception to that, too. And I think it's a random set of events that could have really happened to really anyone. And, you know, to be honest, all those deaths, unfortunately, are very much explainable. And a lot of things were happening long before the movie was even produced. Um, and for, for instance, Julian Beck, you know, who's a fine actor, a wonderful man, so sweetheart. He unfortunately was dying of cancer, you know, long before the production even began. Um, and then, you know, after the fact, yes, he died after the show. I don't really know if he was around after, before the film even finished. But people put all the pieces of the puzzle together and they say, well, you know, he died. Therefore, it's part of the curse right. and everything else. And then, you know, I think people at the end of the day um, believe what they want to believe. And if anything, what's great about it, it makes the movie last longer. It creates an urban legend and there's a longevity to it, you know. And I think the good thing about that is that more people end up watching Poltergeist. It lasts another couple generations. Yep. So in 100 years from now, people will go, yeah, I saw that film, you know, Poltergeist. And it was, you know, it was, it, now we have 3D effects and, you know, holographic entertainment. But they'll look back at Poltergeist and it'll still be entertaining. And people will remember it because they're, their great grand great grandparents will remember the movie, and you know who knows it'll probably get made again, you know, a couple more times. I'm sure well, that's probably true. Uh, thank yeah. you for answering that. Was for Travis Goddard, listener. So, I mean, you're you're right. Like, very few movies will last forty years, like being hugely popular without um, a little bit of mythology alongside them. Like, yeah. very few stand on their own mm -hmm. merit for that much time. So. Yeah, you need you kind of need that to fuel the engine, you know, the mythology and, and make it piece of, a piece of popular culture. Now, did you attend the premiere for Poltergeist? I did. We actually didn't have an official premiere. Oh. It was we had a screening of it at the studio, which was so much fun. And that's what I went to it. And I was I didn't know what to expect. I, I was terrified. Actually, I saw the movie. And it's funny because I knew what was coming and I was still scared by those moments in it. That's awesome. Uh, when did you realize there would be a sequel and how soon were you signed up to reprise the role of Robbie? I was, it was a godsend that there was a sequel and I'll tell you why. I was in the middle of being bullied in junior high and I was the worst. I mean, every day I got beat up. I mean, and you would think, whoa, you're, you're a child doctor, you're a star. How could that possibly happen? And, you know, that was all the more reason why it happened because kids were jealous and my school did nothing about it. So literally every day I, I found myself like in a trash can and I talked to the principal about it, and he was like, well, you know, Oliver, you have to, have to learn to defend yourself. You gotta, if you're in the bathroom, you've got to just put up your dukes. And I'm like, well, I'm this little guy. I can't, I don't really know how to fight. And so lo and behold, the studio called and said, Oliver, 
We're doing a sequel for Poltergeist and we're going to take you out of school. I'm like, really? <laughs> well, thank God. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. So I got pulled out like the whole spring semester. Like I remember like eighth grade and I, I went to set and we made that movie and, and it was the best thing that could ever happen to me for my eighth grade year. Wow. Um, so you did the same thing for braces for me later in life that you did with, for clowns in that movie. Oh my God. Um, I forgot about that. <laughs> I never got braces because of that probably. And a few other reasons, but um, do you it's have any great. interesting stories behind the shooting of that or? Well, what's interesting about the braces scene is that that originally, that originally was not intended to be in the movie at all. I was going to be attacked by bees. And um, oh. I was, I was, I had this, deathly fear of bees and they said you know oliver you've got to this is what we're going to do here's a scene the bees are going to cover your entire body i mean i'm not joking live bees and i was oh. like it's never going to happen he says, well if you want to be in the movie you've got to have the bees cut. i'm like well i won't be in the movie then. there's no way the bees are ever going to be covering it so they actually brought me into the production office on the sequel and they had this bee trainer i'm not joking they're, they're actually bee trainers in hollywood and they said look this bee can actually take commands when we tell it to jump off you, it'll jump. So I said, and I was, you know, I was a precocious, you know, 14 year old kid. I'm like, this is something I really want. I can't wait to see a train bee who takes commands. And the guy actually took his little, he had like a little portable cage of bees with him. And he took the bee out and he said, I'm going to give it a command. And now it'll jump away. And I'm like, okay. And he did it. Didn't do anything. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Uh, I'm not doing this. Scene with you. <laughs> so I can't move, I can't move. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> so that's when they said they got creative and they're like let's do braces you know and i think you know and something i've learned with filmmaking at the time the filmmakers were like oh shit you know we can't do our b scene that's that's our vision but they came up with something better because when you really think about a 14 year old boy with braces that's really a part of a adolescence and childhood far more organic to the character than bees ever would have been too mm -hmm. so i think it was, it was kind of a blessing in disguise the bees were unionized <laughs> yeah, they were they were ready to go on strike. I think. <laughs> now, if another uh, Poltergeist sequel or like a, a reunion was made, would you come back for that? I would. I, I mean, honestly, I'd like to make the a sequel. You know, and do the film because I, I I think it would be it'd be interesting. With my perspective as a filmmaker now, and also having you know, I, I have a true love for the movie, and I'm passionate about it. Um, I'd love to make another installment of Poltergeist. Oh, that would be awesome. You could, you could, and I, I don't think you'd want to, you know, replicate the movie as it is, try to copy, because Poltergeist will live on its own, in its own form, and you should never really touch that. You want to reinvent it in some way, or bring a new vision to it, and mm -hmm. use the core element, you know, of Poltergeist, if you were going to ever redo it. Otherwise, you just end up with something that's going to probably most likely be subpar compared to the original. Right, like the one that did come out, the remake? Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, like, boy, that kind of describes yeah. what happened. But yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's it's so hard to make. And, you know, those guys, I'm sure, and we all have to work, and they're like, hey, we're going to remake right. Poltergeist. And it's like, what do you do with that? And it, it's it's really difficult. And there's so many chefs in the kitchen, for especially a big studio movie, and they're probably telling right. them, you have to do this, and we want this. And, you know, it's easy to beat up the filmmakers. But, you know, it's difficult to, you know, even – venture into trying to do a remake of that movie right were you disappointed um that the freelings uh none of them returned except for carol ann for part three you know it's funny you're gonna laugh but i've never seen the full version of the third installment and a lot of people love it i just i've never seen it i have to i have to watch it though too um they never asked me to be in it at mm. all too and it's i haven't seen it just because i'm like oh they didn't ask me i'm never gonna watch that movie it just didn't I don't know. It just, it just never really interested me. Um, I just kind of, in my mind, the Polarize, the first two are really the movies that that's what the film is really all about, especially the first one, you know, and that's the purest, right. purest sense of that film and the meaning of it all. And welcome back to CF3 TV. This week's film is 1982's Toby Hooper epic, Poltergeist. May not be the tremendous epic that you know, but it's one of the best ones you don't know. We're talking the Freeling family, a typical suburban family living the life out in wonderful suburbia. Unfortunately, ghosts start to appear friendly 
moving objects around the house, moving everybody around, and then things turn a little bit nasty and they start to terrorize the family before they kidnap the youngest daughter. The family has to do something. They call in some help, but is it too much or is it too late? But dames, I have a very, very important question for you. Can you ride a bicycle with a 24 pack of beer under your arm? Well, what I can do, Jeff, is <laughs> oh, shit. Ah! It's the wrong one. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> now we got uh, it. Oh, um, man, no. I would, I would be dropping that beer before anyone even fucked with me. <laughs> no RC cars needed for that one. Right. Oh, and, and neither can I, but I do have my trusty oh, yeah. PBR. Oh, God. I'd rather drink the Mountain Dew than PBR. Yeah, but that's oh. not just Mountain Dew. What is that? Watermelon. No, that's Mountain Dew. That's watermelon one. It's pretty good. You should actually try it. It's magical. You've got a leader. And this, my sir, is vodka. I'm going to be on <laughs> in two seconds. No, it's water. Is there a worm in that bottle? Oh, wrong, wrong part of the trilogy. Sequel. Sequelitis, <laughs> if we're going to do that one. Okay, Jeff, let's start off with one of our favorite segments, Rev It Up. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Let's hit the gas with Poltergeist and Rev It Up. What we got are a couple of classic cars scattered through the movie. If you blink, though, you actually miss them. Um, I actually compared my little list to what I was seeing on uh, IMDb for cars. I think it's like IMCDB. And uh, so if you ever have a question about a car that's not covered on here, or you just want to see what other cars are in movies, that's a good place to go. Uh, feel free to sponsor us too. Project Nerd loves you as well. Um, but what we have is a 1979 Pontiac Firebird that the daughter shows up late to the party at the end of the movie, the fancy red car. Um, if you blink, if you missed it, there was a 70s Corvette Stingray parked on the side of the road. That one is not listed on the Internet Movie Car Database. Uh, but you also have classic Ford Broncos. Uh, the family vehicle is basically an Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser. It's a station wagon, 1981. And the other one I noticed was the Chevy, um, uh, the Chevrolet Chevelle Malibu. I had to get the name right. I thought it was just a Chevelle. So I had to correct myself in my research. But those are our cars, the classic cars of Poltergeist, 1982. Do you have any info on the bulldozer? Oh, that's a caterpillar, I believe. Oh. That, that's actually listed on there as well, but I didn't think to consider that like a, a car. Did so you rev up, <laughs> rev up the caterpillar? <laughs> Fair enough. Nice job. Nice job. Many, many deets. Dames Marvs, take us into <clears throat> the Playboy watch. Ooh, well, are we watching the work? The kids are a little too young uh, to be reading the plebs, and the dad is uh, <laughs> he's more of a TV guide kind of guy. <laughs> so uh, what I was able to find here is really, truly amazing. There's actually a Playboy Playmate from Brazil, and she appeared in a Brazilian issue of Playboy magazine, February 1994. I don't have it. And frankly, to order it would be like 30 bucks plus 30 bucks shipping. Um, so we're going to have Dane post a picture of it. But the Playmate's fucking name. Boy, Poltergeist is taking over the episode, man. Um, this is, yeah, you can't fun. even edit that. <laughs> you can't even edit that shit. I'm like, <laughs> that wasn't here. I think our uh, I think our broadcast sound effect cursed. that we're adding to our track. our broadcast is cursed. It's killing people this already. Is, this is my dumbfounded face. Not just my dumb face, but like the I'm well, literally it's pretty much the face. same face though. I mean, sure. Um, but Regina Poltergeist is her last name. Look it, I'm not even lying. Regina Regina Na is it Regina Na? Regina Na. <laughs> Poltergeist. 
Por que preferia en también a capital do sexo? Uh, you know what? I, right there. I may drop the 60 bones to see what she looks like in there. It's not the only pony you'd be dropping on that. Thank you, Jeff. Right? That concludes the Playboy segment. Hey, I'll tell you when segments are over. <laughs> They're Fair never enough. over. Um, now it's time for the return of one that we haven't been able to do for a while. Um, because of the movies that we've chosen but it's time for mad about the movies mad about the movies guys mad magazine yes so they did do a parody of poltergeist it was in mad number 237 from march 1983 i don't own this magazine just kidding i do it's right here let's try that again it's right here okay so flipping through the pages, you notice that it's called Paltry Guys, which if you read the preceding paragraph um, before the title, it actually does make sense. So once again, we do have a guest who is Mad Magazine famous. Oliver Robbins played Robbie Freeling. And in Mad Magazine, he gets the name Blobby Feeling. When they introduce him on the splash panel page, he says, I'm scared of the big oak tree outside. I'm scared of the strange creaking noises in the attic. I'm scared of the glowing lights in the closet. I'm eight years old. People ask me what I want to be when I grow up. I tell them I want to be nine. In this house, that ain't going to be easy. So that is some classic Mad Magazine humor there. And it is a full, full-on spread written by Arnie Kogan, art by the great Jack Davis, who's done many famous movie posters and album covers. And this one's a great one. I do need to pick up this issue for real because mad fans, you're going to find some great humor in this, including um, the last panel, which goes on to show how this movie just absolutely decimated other films at the box office, like Blade Runner. So that was mad. And uh, I am really going to buy the issue. I, I'm surprised that I didn't have it and very disappointed in myself, quite frankly. I'm disappointed in you too. So. <laughs> I'm not disappointed um, at all. Thank you for okay. your efforts. Because you expect it. <laughs> Let's play Total Recast, you guys. For the memory of a lifetime, recast, recast, recast. Okay, let's start off Total Recast with our good old friend and brother, even yours, Jeff, is even your brother at this point, James Mark. I think I need another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <clears throat> I got a couple. The first one, a couple. That's a <laughs> that's a cue. The <laughs> couple that I, I, you know, I've been watching uh, a lot of horror movies, and I feel like one of my favorite actors on the planet has incorporated himself into a few of my favorite horror movies over the years, and that would be Kevin Bacon. Now, Kevin Bacon is married to Kara Sedgwick. So in my total recast, the first one, I would like to replace Joe Beth Williams and Craig T. Nelson with Sir Kevin Bacon and Miss Kara Sedgwick. Is Kevin Bacon British? <laughs> Certainly looks like it. Uh, he looks like a sir. I mean, he doesn't look like he's lost slept for nine days, though. All right, let's clear this up because I don't want to hear hate on the the feed. Kevin Bacon has not been knighted, okay? <laughs> he's just a man. He's just a man that you might call sir <laughs> when you're speaking to him. All right, now that we've cleared that up, we'll get on to my second one. Zelda Rubenstein. The, uh, the old lady uh, that comes in and tries to clean this house. Uh, I would replace her with half Kenyan, half British actor Deep Roy. They're very similar in stature, and they kind of look like brothers. I remember and this. <laughs> so I, why not? Why not? No, I know you're not looking at the same person, everybody. <laughs> on the the left, only difference is the glasses <laughs> and the frown the left, versus the smile. Deep Roy, and on the right was Zelda. So, or don't she have them flipped uh, around? No, I'm okay. Well, yeah, whatever. To me, whatever. To you guys, uh, yeah, 
it might be different. But those are my total recasts for this one. Well, I'm not going to insult you this time. How about that? That's how well you did. <laughs> I appreciate it. Jeff, you are up, my man. Well, I wouldn't recast anything out of the original. If we were going to do a remake, and I mean a real one, not the the crappy one from a few years ago. 2015. I would, uh, yeah, a few years ago. We, we, we've grown past that one, my friend. Um, I would go for Dr. Lesh. I would actually bring in D. Wallace. Uh, well, you're never going to get me to disagree with casting D. Wallace in something mm -hmm. as she was on our show <laughs> for those who have been listening oh, yeah. and watching for a long time. We love her. We love D. And I would love to see her in anything new and <laughs> famous. Well, I think that would use her talents and she'd get a good bit out of the movie. So um, my other choice is I would actually bring back Craig T. Nelson, but not as Mr. Freeling. I would bring him back as the neighbor Ben Tuckdale and let him play a remote control war with the new, the new family. Can you see an aged version of this man playing the neighbor in a yes. little cameo? I sure can yep. as well. Hollywood uh, does that a lot where they bring back the original person in just a little gotcha cameo. And that's See, great. I'd cast him mm. as one of the skeletons in the pool. <laughs> no, he's got too much meat on his bones for that one. <laughs> Those are real skeletons, by the way. I haven't, I haven't seen yeah, them. They were. They were and that's why, that's that is why a lot of people think that this movie is cursed. I don't know what your guys' standing on it is after speaking with Robbie. Do you... Do you have any like overriding he's, sentiment? One he's way hiding it. He's hiding things so that he will live. Like he has been, <laughs> yeah, he's been told he found, to say it's not cursed, and he found, found the way. He All he needs to hear it. is, "Would you like to a bay view window right here, looking out over this, and be like, oh, I'm out." Well, before I forget to do my own total recast, um, let's get to that. Because I wanted to cast, I believe his name is Teague, the um, land developer, mm -hmm, shady mm -hmm. land developer. Picture. There's his backside. There's his backside. <laughs> He's casting his butt. <laughs> There's his side side. Uh, I'm recasting Teague with uh, Kevin McCarthy. Kevin Ooh, McCarthy oh, from I like it. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Twilight mm -hmm. Zone, Piranha. Um, it's, this is a different person um, that I than I the one I used last time, but it's the same role because I just I struggled to find lots of roles that were um, I think recastable in this because it was kind of perfectly cast in my opinion. So, but that's that and that's total recast. Um, let's talk about some of our favorite lines from this film. Um, Jeff, what jumps out for you? Y'all mind hanging back? You're jamming my frequency. <laughs> <laughs> By deep right, right? Zelda? Is that That's your Zelda? Right. That was my Zelda impersonation. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get these two out of the way just because they are iconic and like everybody talks about them all the time. They're here. That was, that's yeah, one I wasn't gonna go with that one. Yeah. And the other one. This house is clean. <laughs> Only to be proven wrong. <laughs> she was so wrong about that. Spoiler alert. And that's why it's funny to me that that's so like iconic and quotable and stuff. Because she was wrong. She was wrong. Uh, that's one of my favorite lines. The dog barking. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's got to raid all the snacks in the house before the ghosts show up. So, Our broadcast, once again, is cursed. It's a fly. We got flies, sirens, dogs, and um, dames, some of your favorite lines from the movie. Well, you took my goddamn, they're here. I'm sorry. I mean, classic. I knew somebody would. Carol, but I'm gonna go with uh, uh, Steve Freeling screaming 
at Teague. And I believe it goes something like this. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you son of a bitch! You moved the cemetery! You left the bodies, didn't you? You son of a bitch! You left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! Why? Ah! Why? James, have you ever considered Shakespeare? <laughs> well, he's shaking pretty good over there right now. So. Who's that? <laughs> never, never heard of him. Bill? Bill Shakespeare? Oh. Or, or yeah, his younger uh, brother, John. He was Captain Kirk. He played Captain Kirk. No, Larry. Bill Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Right? That's sh Leonard that's Nemo and Bill Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Leonard Shatsby, Nemo. Yeah. Speaking of Leonard Nemo, one of my favorite lines in the movie <laughs> is Nemo? Finding Nemo? Um, Boy, how's that in our show? To her, it is simply another child. To us, it is the beast. That's Damn. some poignant stuff there. That's heavy. That's deep, man. That's heavy, Doc. Not as deep as Roy, but <laughs> it's up there. It could have been said by him. <laughs> um, have you guys ever sleepwalked before? And do you believe in it? Do I believe in it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was mean, watching a show the other day, and I'm only bringing this up because there was sleepwalking in this movie. Um, somebody like claimed that they killed somebody while sleepwalking. It was their wife, and they claimed it was sleep kill killing. <laughs> Do you believe in sleep killing? Uh, is what I'm asking you. Yes. You do, Dames. I do. And Jeff, you don't. Yeah. And I'm an I don't know. Okay. So. Let's go back oh, because Jim, I, we're a jury trying to convince. We Dane, I believe when this movie came out, like we were scared to go to sleep because we thought we might hurt somebody in our sleep. That was something that um, occurred when we were kids. I was scared of the clown. <laughs> We well yes, but we used to be like, what if we, what if I grabbed the knife in my sleep? We used to do. We were scared of shit like that. In the blue house in Bingen. This is what I Absolute, was scared of. Absolutely. Oh, well, there you go. That's <laughs> fucking terrifying. Thank you for that. <laughs> why did they have that clown? I asked that to Oliver. We won't go over that again. But why? Why did they have that clown in there? Why is it under the bed? What? Why do you look? I had this conversation with somebody last night. If you hear something under your bed, are you looking? Also, dude, looking they left at... it. Also, after they thought the house was clean, they left that clown there. Yeah. <laughs> they tempted mm -mm. fate. They mm -mm. left a lot of crap. Why would that clown survive? Like the clean out. I mean. Well, didn't like the mom or the dad straight up ask, like, did you pack everything? And they said, yes, everything but the bed. Well, clearly you didn't pack everything up. I mean, you got to leave some of that Star Wars stuff, that's for sure. But not the, the alien clown. movie poster. <laughs> not the clown. Um, now it's time for a segment called I Deserve More Credit. Who wants to go first? I'll go first this time. So mine is... Beatrice Strait, and she played Dr. Lesh in this film. And I think that she deserves more credit because she's actually, did you guys know this? She's an Oscar winner for Best oh. Supporting Actress for Network, which is one of my favorite movies. It's very funny, um, poignant to this day still. Um, and she has the record still for shortest performance to win an Oscar. Her screen time is like, criminally low like three or four minutes of screen time but she gives these like monologues and is amazing so beatrice you deserve more credit well dane that just makes me mad as hell and i'm not gonna take it anymore so you should respond by giving your own i deserve more credit oh, yes uh, uh my good yes i will do that Thanks. uh my more credit is joe beth williams who plays Mrs. Freeling in this film. She recently, and I say recently, is in 2018, she started in an episode of one of my favorite new shows called The Good Doctor. <laughs> she plays a character named Ruth. 
Uh, she plays a character named Ruth in an episode called She, focused on parents making decisions for their transgender children. And that happened in 2018. And to see her again after all this time was quite lovely. So she deserves more credit. I will give her that credit. And Jeff, who are you? Uh, thank you. And who I think deserves more credit is the cinematographer, Matthew Leonetti. Leonetti, sorry. <laughs> he has uh, gone on and done uh, a nice range of movies. You might recognize movies like Ice Pirates, Weird Science, favorite episode of the podcast days, Commando, Strange Days, Demolition <laughs> Man he did some work on, Rob Zombie's Halloween, and Expendables. This is just a little condensing, condensing up the list, but he's going on to do some of Commando. Work. Speaking of Commando, do you have any pictures of him in his underwear on the ceiling? I bet you don't. No, no. because I'm not you. <laughs> but you did have me at Commando for him. Um, <laughs> he filmed like a record number of, I think, deaths on screen at that time for a single mm -hmm. film. Um, that's awesome. So good job, guys. Dames, are you ready to tackle the budget and box office for this? Let's do this shit. All right, guys. So the budget for this film was $10.7 million, which was modest. Um, you know, there wasn't a ton of stuff they needed to go outside of the realm of what's normal in films to pay for. Um, and this got a whopping box office return of $76.6 million. However... Depending on where you go on the internet, you can find totals as high as 121 million for the gross of this film. So, our official site that we use, 76.6, but other sources may say, and this is not cause for inflation uh, either. I looked that up. It's 121 million. That's a quite a huge discrepancy um, for worldwide totals. So, there you have it. All right, guys, let's go over our final thoughts for Poltergeist 1982. All right, final thoughts for Poltergeist 1982. What a fun movie this was. You know, we did this before in our podcast days, and I liked it plenty just back then, but I, on a second review, I actually enjoyed it a, a little bit more than I thought I would. I actually looked at this a little more seriously. Um, the only kind of drawbacks to me were some of the, some of the special effects. The CGI was just a bit out of touch for me, but you know, when they were working with the practical stuff, it was outstanding. So I got a really good kick out of all of the practical effects. The scoring is outstanding. Thank you, Jerry Goldsmith. Acting was really good. At times it felt a little over the top, but without going too crazy. And it's a really good time. Can't really go wrong with this one. It's, I think this is one of those flicks of Toby Hoopers that doesn't get talked about enough because everybody talks Texas Chainsaw Massacre and half of his other flicks. Well, this one should be right up there with the, with that discussion. Yeah, and sometimes they claim that it wasn't even directed by him, that it was directed by Spielberg, basically. Um, but to sum it up, Jeff like Jeff likey this, or hates this. <laughs> <laughs> and he likes this, the practical effects. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James Marvs, you're back up. Let's give us give us your final thoughts, please. This movie is a childhood classic for me and you, I'm sure. Um, it hits us both in different ways, but when I was watching this, it probably has more of an influence than I even remember. Um, what I will say is I think that when Carol Ann goes into the TV and then the, they do the whole thing to pull her out, that feels like the end of the movie to me. And then the fact that there's so much more that happens after that Man, it's just a ride. It's a ride that keeps you your heart elevated, especially if you're like within the the five to twelve year old range. This movie would have terrified the shit out of you. And I know that we didn't look under. I still don't look under my bed if I hear something. Um, I love the dynamic of the family and the characters, especially the husband and wife. How they're on the bed, just uh, you know, that's that's our parents, man. That's our parents. It had to be. Um, so I love that dynamic. I think they really captured the family. Uh, yeah, there you go. The family aspect of things. And then the, 
I love the first introduction to the to the ghosts where it's playful. It's very playful. Like in the kitchen, she's like, "Look, look what we can make them do!" And then all of a sudden, they're getting fucking terrorized, and it turns from playful into hateful, and then vengeful, and then well, the house implodes on itself. Spoiler alert! So my final <laughs> score is coming up, but I love this movie. I love you guys. Go ahead, Dane. Oh, wow. I'm up already. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the parents playing on the bed type of thing. Um, and when you think about it, that was like the last moment of innocence in their lives. Because like it was like the next day or something that the, th- the activity really started picking up and everything went to hell for three movies. <laughs> <laughs> ripped their family apart. Um, but yeah, I, I too Speaking like this. Going to hell. Whatever. I'm all out. I like that it started. Um, you can have some of my, this isn't going to quench your thirst, but you can have some of my <laughs> Cheetos, which this podcast is not podcast, but broadcast is brought to you by. Who's the manufacturer of Cheetos? Nabisco? <laughs> are, you <Classic>. <laughs> um, are you asking who's going to start giving us money? Frito Lay is going to have to yes. start giving us some money. Frito Lay, Frito Lay, um, for the Cheetos, and also guests of our show. That's you, Oliver. Stay at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> Brought to you by <laughs> IHG Hotels. Um, but yeah, I like it a lot, and similar to Damon, scared the hell out of me as a kid and gave me nightmares galore. But now, now when you kind of look at it, it's not that scary. Um, and, but it is still like a movie that you could show to like, like I could show it to like my older nieces who are like 10, 12. And I would feel okay with that, but they might you be scared. permission for that? that, that I was like, amazing. I was watching this at like three. So yeah, well, our parents were clearly dickheads. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to insert Oliver's score right here. So, I mean, Poltergeist, so uh, zero to 100 on, like, on what sc- The cult filmometer. So uh, as a cult film, or um, you can rate it against other films all time. Any, there's no wrong way to, to approach it. So I'm so close to it. But I would say, you know, I would give it, I would say 75. I go. I think a fair. I think seventy-five is a good number on you know because it. This is why, and this is my logic behind that is that the film is you know over forty years old now. We're all still talking about it. They've remade it multiple times, and you know I just watched it the other day and it, and it truly really holds up. Um, now I think for a film to really be a cult classic, it has to be can even it should even last longer you know, and and the reason why I'm not giving it above a seventy-five I think is because it. We don't really know. We don't know what the future really holds. In 30 years, you know, the film could be really dated and a generation and might not relate to them. You know, a lot of films early, like I went to go see it happen one night, and I know, in a theater um, at this library, I remember. And I was thinking these jokes for me are just, you know, they're really working. But people there are like 80 years old, loved it. And they're laughing out loud. They thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. So, you know what? In 40 years, you know, people will be watching Poltergeist and like, this doesn't, this is not really working. I don't find it scary. The special effects are cheesy. And, you know, a lot of special effects, you know, aren't perfect, but, you know, so many other elements on the film are powerful and they really do work. You know, like, and that's why I think it could, maybe we can move up to like an 85, 90 in like 20 years of the thing still has the, still has the kind of staying power. If it becomes, you know, like a Casablanca, because Casablanca works so well, even today, you don't look at those scenes and go, wow, this is really cheesy. Sure. It's still, sure. They're, they're powerful. They still work. So you're keeping ego and personal experience out of your score. Just yeah, for, I think for really the record. I'm trying to be, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to be, <laughs> I'm trying to be somewhat critical having gone to like film school and we, t- that's what we do. Yeah. We sit around and just talk about movies and break down movies and analyze films. So I, I think, you know, I, I wasn't a critical studies major, but you know, I think it's important to look at, you know, assess a movie for what it's worth and, and, not only what how it impacts culture and how it impacts people in general and their general feelings about it. I'm glad that you are able to watch this movie, though. Um, you mentioned just watching it recently. Like a lot of people who are in movies say they don't care to watch them. Or I was 
scared that maybe you you're like no this movie's cursed and i will not watch it again it's too painful all these people no. are dead you know so no so, and i think you should celebrate these lives i mean we're all gonna go at some point and we, we don't know it could be tonight it could be 100 years from now we we have no idea nice knowing you, know, you guys Right. <laughs> Jeff, what um, do you, you know? so, yeah i think we should watch these films and celebrate their lives and you know and this is this is our contribution to humanity you know we might only if i never make another movie again or if i'm another another big film at least i had this this moment in time and i got to share that with the world okay so oliver gave oh, it a very realistic harsh 75 it was i think it's a little <laughs> harsh but he was approaching it as a film scholar um he went to usc so who are we to argue um but let's get the rest of our scores here. Three, two, one. We got a 95, an 84, and a 91. Still looks like a 16 to me for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with Jeff all hated this movie. <laughs> we'll get to one of those eventually. Let's see. What say you? You see, your stupid lives. Stupid, stupid. It's an 86.25. Woo! You fellas, you know where that put We got Howard the Duck at the bottom of the pack. We got Joysticks at 81.25. Poltergeist at 86.25. Just below Topping Mall at 88 on the button. Nice. Um, so it's a little, I think it's a little low, obviously, given what I scored it, but we can blame Oliver for that. But let's not blame him because he was in it, so he probably knows better than all of us. <laughs> right. And Oliver, I still want to know what you're hiding because I know that this movie is cursed and you know it too. So come out with it! <laughs> and it's all because of those real skeletons that they used. How come Joe Beth... <laughs> She's the one that had to deal with those, and she's alive still. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, sleep on oh it. Oh, my God. <laughs> sleep on it for a while. And um, we're going to end this haunted broadcast, this cursed broadcast. And this has been CF3 for another week. Um, any final thoughts, you guys? Yep. Okay, I'm going to get it right this time. There we go. There we go. Rest in peace, Dominic Dunn, one of the unfortunate victims of the curse. Dude, why was uh, why was the mom just laughing off blatant sexual harassment of her daughter? It was nice. By those construction employees. Oh, oh okay. Fair it was enough. 1980s. You can just say it was 1980-anything. Yeah. Hold on, though. Was it okay for a 30-year-old man to love a 14-year-old girl in 1980? <laughs> Here on CF3, have fun that's everlasting, binging on cold films. And totally recasting, interviewing stars, and making fun of Dave's Mars. What's your favorite line? And what's your latest call?